Okay, uh, th there's a, a considerable amount there to work with. Some will be familiar. Let me uh, let me write a definition. There are many definitions, uh, and a lot of them are good. Now the real question is, uh, will this marker last long enough to write the definition? <laughs> I mean, all over the world we've switched away from blackboards. Oh, by the way, don't talk when you type or spell the word ethnomethodology. It needs your full attention, OK? <laughs> um, we moved away from blackboards. And uh, since then, uh, none of these things work. And they're very expensive, so I think it's part of the corporate lobby in the university systems. I like teaching in the third world because they're still using blackboards. Can you see this? Is it, we're going to need another one. Maybe I'm not writing large enough. Well, they can always come down here to see. Yeah, we've got it. Yeah, remember, I always start asking the last row questions. So. OK. So here's a definition. Ethnomethodology. And, and you might memorize it so when somebody asks you, what is it? You can just uh, roll this off your tongue and, uh, and then walk away fast. <laughs> Ethnomethodology studies the naturally occurring work of producing and describing the local order. So we're interested in order. Several of you got that. Several of you spoke about producing. Um, and we'll talk about that. There's some interesting issues about, about the word producing. Um, but generally, you can call what ethnomethodologists study order phenomena. What, it, what are order phenomena? Which order is this? It's the order that people use to provide the local orderliness of their lives. We can't get things done unless things are somehow ordered and we are able to expect what is going to happen next. Ethnomethodology and conversation analysis look at accounts that people naturally develop in this uh, occupation of organizing the local orderliness of their lives. And these accounts are naturally occurring. And that is what distinguishes ethnomethodology. We're looking at things that occur all by themselves and not things that we've made up. Now I have another question for you. What is meant by describing here, what what is meant by this? Who's describing? Are we talking about? Who's when you when you speak of ethnomethodology, you have this word method in here. Whose methods are they? It's not the the social researcher. We're not talking about the methods used by the social researcher. Yes. Yes, yes. It's, it's how they describe the local order. And why would they describe the local order? Yes. As 
suppose they have a particular perspective perspective of it. Like they're in the in the thick of it. They, they have a they can't be objective about it. They're so well, you you could not be objective and still be quiet. Well, why do you describe it? Why do people? Why are people constantly describing what they're doing? If we're studying not how we describe it, you might say we're describing, they're describing. Why? Why are they doing all this describing? What's the function of it? Yes. Yes, so that other people can look at the situation in the same way and thereby an order can be set up so that everybody is on the same page. So people are creating the local order, they're producing the local order through these descriptions and we call these descriptions accounts. And we say that situations because of the describing that people are doing in situations, the situations are naturally accountable. That is, the people in the descripting, in the describing, are producing accounts, which are summaries of how we're supposed to be doing what we're doing now. And why do people like doing that, do you wonder? I have a theory, and that is that people want things to be orderly, mostly so that they know what to do in order to stay out of trouble. That is, job one for every person in every situation is to stay out of trouble. And that's not easy. People are willing to stay out, do anything to stay out of trouble. They'll go along with any order possible. Or if not to stay out of trouble, a close second would be not to look stupid, right? I mean, we're really concerned about that. So how do we not look stupid? How do we stay out of trouble? We, we do what people expect us to do. But in most situations, we don't know what that is. We're not sure. We're willing to do anything, but we're not sure what that anything is. And so we get into trouble even despite ourselves. And that's very frustrating. I was just trying to, to do it right. I just didn't know what right was. So how do you find out what right is? You listen to the people describing. You, you listen to the accounts that people produce. And these accounts are a natural part of the everyday work that people are doing. Oh good, a nice, robust. Uh, anybody have a favorite color? We'll, we'll go with blue now. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> um, ethnomethodology, that method also has nothing to do with the sociologist. Rather, it's the ology, right? Ology is the study of, right? You have geology, the study of the world, zoology, the study of animals. Well, ethnomethodology is the study of ethnomethods. Now, which methods are these? These are the methods that we're studying. These are the methods of the people who are organizing the local orderliness of their mundane lives so that everybody can get on the same page and stay out of trouble. So they can do what they're supposed to do. And so that they can get on with whatever the task is at hand, whether it's baking bread or creating a, a, a musical performance or, uh, or playing a game. So whatever methods people use to create the local order are the methods we're studying. So that's what ethnomethodology is. The natural accountability is very, very unique uh, because it leads us to research methods which are less disruptive than 
most research methods. That is, we don't try to coerce data. We're not, we don't take an imperialistic approach to our data. Rather, we want to see the definition of phenomenology. You heard that word. You might be wondering, what is phenomenology? Uh, Heidegger described it in his fabulous book, Being in Time. The, the study of how things show themselves in the very way they present themselves from themselves. That's a, a lot of words to say, just shut up and listen. Just watch. Just wait for it to show itself and don't try to add anything. Never mind you're a, a Lacanian, Freudian, and you're interpreting everything in terms of, of that theory. Turn all that off. That's the brackets, that's the parentheses around your ideas. Don't do so much thinking. Just listen to how people show from themselves what exactly they're doing in their own voice. Now, social scientists don't like doing that, even though you think they would uh, make a career out of it. Um, rather, they do things like interviews. They interview people. I'm doing my interviews. I've, you'll have a graduate student report to you, oh, I scheduled all my interviews. I'm on a roll to get my PhD done on time. Right? And the problem with interviews is that and think about this really seriously, because you're probably going to be involved in doing interviews. The problem is when you ask somebody a question, they give you an answer that is what they think it is you want to hear. You're trying to get along. And nine times out of 10, people will tell you what they think it is you want them to say. Sometimes people will go off on a limb, but most of the time they're just trying to, to satisfy you, your situation. Okay, you, you'll sit down with the interview. What, what is it you want? What is it you need from me? And, and so every answer is tailored for you, the researcher, so you're contaminating every answer. There might be some grain of truth in a couple of the answers, but most of it is nonsense. I mean, they're going to give a different interview to somebody else. And yeah, another fabulous part, it's, it's another example of what we were talking about, people not understanding each other, uh, nine times out of ten as well, they don't know what it is you want. They guess wrong. So you, there's a kind of a sinking feeling when you realize that, oh, half of this is made up because they've come up with the wrong idea. They think I'm a Marxist and want just radical answers for, to everything because I come from a department that edits the main journal in Marxist sociology. So you're another Marxist. So I'll give you Marxism so you're happy and so we get along. Right? And I'm going, holy cow, you know. Uh, I've got all this data that's no good, and and they've even guessed wrong, right? So so I don't trust interviews. In fact, I don't do interviews. I mean occasionally I'll do an interview, but only to discover suggestions for situations that I can then go and study or video record that I can then study the naturally occurring phenomena in that situation. There might be, like I'm studying coffee tasting now. It's fabulous. I'm going to spend on, on the 7th, I'm going to BKI Coffee and going to film their tasting lab. Uh, they do some pretty good coffee. Actually, all the Scandinavian coffees, just fabulous because they roast like, but don't get me going your coffee. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, I'm a sociologist. I just drink coffee. I'm not a coffee taster. So I need for them to tell me what's important. The, if we're studying the ethnomethods of people, here's a couple of thoughts. People are doing a lot of things. They're doing many, many things, and several people said complicated things. And it's so complicated, how do I decide what to write about? I mean, which of those things do I write about? Well, if I'm a Freudian, I'll write about one thing. If I'm a Marxist, I write about something else. If I'm a feminist, I write about something else. If I'm a uh, environmentalist, I write about something else. In fact, I'll give you an example. Uh, before I headed off to the field for my doctoral research, which was in Central Australia with Aboriginal people, 
um, I was an ethnomethodologist, but I was also interested in living in the wilderness, and I wanted to discover how people who do that for life and not a bourgeois hobby did it. And so I went out and uh, went to Australia and, uh, and studied the language. And I read, as preparation, 20 books at least, a stack this high, of anthropological tomes on Aboriginal people. And every, every book was like, you know, like, you know the story of the ten blind men and the elephant? Right? You, you, have, uh, you, have, you have ten men, uh, some of them very wise with beards, and they're blind though. And they're going up to the elephant, and one puts their arm out and grabs one of the feet and says, oh, it's like a tree. It's like a big tree. Uh, and an another puts his hand on the tail and says, oh, it's like a broom. Uh, and another puts his hand on the, on the trunk and says, oh, it's a, a bit like a fire hose. And so they all have this argument about, about what it is, because each is grabbing onto a different aspect of it. That's what it was like reading these, these anthropological studies. I mean, you've got the Freudian study, you know, uh, uh, you know even, even by a student of Freud, you, you got uh, the, functional, the, the structural functionalists talking about kinship structure. I mean, oh my god. Yeah. They, kinship is very important. I don't know if it's more important for Aboriginal people than other people, but it is very important. And we do organize kins in different ways from society to society. And you need an Aboriginal society to know something about that. But I think anthropologists are much more interested in kinship structures than Aboriginal people are. I mean, it's amazing. One, once you had the first definitive study, all the students wrote about it, and then you had anthropologists reading nothing but studies of kinship structure, and that's the only thing for about a generation that we learned about Aboriginal people was the kinship. Well, they do have other parts of their lives, you know. Uh, but you know, it's 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 not untrue. But but you get the kinship structure. You get the Marxist sociologist. Uh, I mean, it's unbelievable. Each one is like, all you are mostly learning about is the world of the ethnographer. And the people are hard to find. In fact, I was fairly convinced by the end of it that I w my brain was so filled with all these different theories and perspectives that I could no longer see the Aboriginal people. And when I got there, I was just projecting one thing from one book after another onto what I was seeing. And all that openness that somebody talked about uh, was no longer operative. So theories help you because you might not have noticed something about a people that are important. But they also fill up your mind so that you can't remain open to learn what you need to know most, which is what you don't know. So how do you discover what you don't know? That's really the question that we're facing. So my professor, Harold Garfinkel, used to say that ethnomethodology is trying to study what is most identifying of the local work of creating reality and creating social order of a group that we're studying. What's the most, I you can't write everything. I can't write everything about coffee tasters. but. You study them long enough until you have a pretty good insight into what's, what's the crux of their daily lives. Now, some of my students say, I mean, as I said, I teach in a Marxist department. Right? We edit the monthly review, which is like the major journal. And especially among the graduate students, we get really gung-ho people. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm a hardcore leftist all my life, but I don't believe the truth is like getting on a bus that says, you know, truth. And, uh, and that you then have to, you can just relax and put the seat back and go for the ride, knowing you're going to get up, end up at the right place. Uh, and a lot of our graduate students are a bit like that. Uh, so uh, they, they are saying, well, all the, we're studying these mundane things. I don't want to study mundane things. I want to study the revolution. 
We don't have time to study mundane things, right? And, and you know, I say, yeah, you know, I, I understand, but, you know, even the revolutionaries, you know, take turns when they talk. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very important. Uh, uh, I sometimes uh, get frustrated. I tell them, look, there's so many mundane things. I, I know we don't have to study them, but somebody ought to, just for sheer numbers, even though they're not important, there's so many of these things that aren't very important that if we're really sociologists, we ought to be studying a few of these, these things just, just because they're everywhere we go, you know, like, like taking turns. Um, and I, 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 I tell them the story of, of, the, uh, of the fabulous uh, uh, negotiations done at the end of World War II between the Americans and the Japanese. The Japanese had surrendered, and the Americans were concerned that the, the whole problem not be reproduced another time. And, uh, and so they tried to uh, create a constitution and a democratic republic which they succeeded. I mean, it's actually quite an achievement. There are, something good has actually happened in history. Uh, there are the, the democratic uh, governance of, mostly democratic, I mean, the corporations run everything, right? But uh, uh, of, of Japan. And, uh, and they, were, uh, they were going through the, con the, the, writing the constitution for the new Japanese governance. And, there were the representatives of the Japanese government and the U.S. negotiators. And the problem is, uh, you know, both America and Japanese are very ethnocentric. I mean, they don't know, they think they're the only store in town, right? I mean, they really don't have a clue what other cultures are doing. I mean, some cultures do. I mean, I, I think Denmark's really good on that score. Uh, but. Uh, well, I won't go on about American ethnocentrism or Japanese ethnocentrism, except to say that they had a hard time communicating. Not just language, but just, just, and the Americans realized, though, these negotiators, that they couldn't just force their views on other people. I mean, they did do Article One of the Constitution and Article Two of the Constitution. And so they relied on their translator, who was the daughter of an American ambassador, uh, and grew up in Japan. So she was not only fluent in Japanese society, but she actually was fluent in Japanese culture. She was bicultural. And she, she really bridged all these gaps, and she was especially good at communicating the needs of the Japanese to the American negotiators. So that the American negotiators said, oh, OK, so we can't do it quite like that. We have to do it in a different way in order to have it compatible with the Japanese society. And she had really been very successful at defending Japanese interests and during these, the, the, the negotiations of this constitution. And, but she really had a pet peeve. And that is she wanted women to have the right to vote. She really felt strongly about that. And she was very worried that these Japanese, all male negotiators, would not, not at all, everyone in the room, but her was male, would not uh, put in universal suffrage, you know, the, the right to vote for everybody. Uh, and she wasn't sure how to do it. And she had conversations with the American uh, negotiators about how to approach the problem. And the head negotiator said, I think we have, I think I've got a good idea. Why don't you? excuse yourself from the room while we have this conversation and we'll approach it from another tack. And so uh, when they came to that part of the Constitution, she excused herself to, to go use the women's room. And while she was out, the head American negotiator said to the Japanese, um, while, while she's out, um, I think we can do the next issue, which she cares about very much. And I don't think there's going to be a, a big dispute about it anyway, uh, because uh, she really thinks it's important that we give women the right to vote. And she's been so helpful to all of us here. The work that she's done, we owe her, a, we are responsible to, if, to, to 
show her how much we value the contributions that she's made. And they go, oh yes, she's really been instrumental to the success of writing this constitution. Uh, and we owe her a lot. And, and so the American negotiators said yes. So because we need to fulfill this responsibility, the best way we can complete the responsibility is to uh, just pass this without any, any discussion or amendments. Uh, and we do it before she comes back. And they said, yes, that's what we have to do. So by the time she came back, women had the right to vote. Okay. Now, I'm sure that, that the people taking my classes at the University of Oregon are th thinking, yes, the right to vote, it was a great ideological victory you know, for, for equal rights and for women's rights and, and all the rest. But actually, it was just that the American negotiators had figured out what are the local rules, what, how are things ordered in this interaction. <laughs> and, and so I use this as an example to say, yes, it's very mundane, uh, the, 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 the Japanese concern about fulfilling obligations in a social level. But because he was able to address the, uh, the Japanese in using the right uh, language and the right uh, local rules, it was successful. So that's an example of, of why studying these mundane things is actually uh, a worthwhile thing. OK, back to methods, um, back to the naturally occurring. That's the methodologists look for phenomena that occur naturally. We don't interview because we don't trust the results. Similarly, we don't give questionnaires. We don't do surveys. People ask me, uh, I was in my office in Trento, uh, there was this uh, Dutch uh, sociologist who had been brought in to teach everybody the new software for uh, for analyzing survey data. And he said, what kind of surveys do you do? I said, I never do surveys. He said, why not? I said, because the answers are never objective. And uh, you know, he was very interested because as a, as a competent survey researcher, he knows darn well they're not objective, right? That is, what's happening if, if I give, give a, a, a survey out to, to everybody here, they, the list of 20 questions, you usually have bubble forms to fill out so the computers can process it easily, you know. Uh, one to five, one to 10, you know, very, very much, not at all, somewhere in between. And they have all these questions, but what does a question mean? As a phenomenologist, I would say you don't know what a question means unless you consider it within the frame of reference of the horizon of meaning of the person who's answering the question. And of course, what, they, what are they doing? It's not only that they have a horizon of meaning, but they're also trying to invent what horizon of meaning the person asking them the question has. And so they're coming up, you know, they have less to work on because it's not an interview. They may not even see the person that wrote the question, but they're still working out what are these people driving at, what answers. What kind of answers do they want? And again, what kind of answers are going to keep me out of trouble? What kind of answers will put me in the best light? What kind of answers uh, you know, are, are consistent with my self-identity and all the rest? And this is going to vary from person to person. That is, if, I, if there's 30 people in the room and I hand out a survey to each one of them, there's 30 different surveys. This is not the same survey. Because the questions you're answering are not the same questions that she's answering. Because they're different questions because of the different lives and the different, I mean, it varies from type of question to type of question. Uh, you, you, might, uh, you might wonder, uh, you know, do you believe in God? You know, that, I had a graduate student who came to Denmark during his sabbatical. Actually, he was a, a, a professor and uh, finished his first six years of teaching and then came to Denmark for a sabbatical and studied uh, atheism in Denmark. Really interesting book he wrote. Uh, been translated into seven languages. And, and 
um, you know, you might ask, do you believe in God? You know, that's a question. You might correlate it with, with age or ethnic group or, or generosity, right? It's really interesting that 15% that of the Danes believe in God and 60% of Americans believe in God, yet the per capita of foreign aid from Denmark is through the roof and American per capita is minimal. So would you conclude objectively that, that believing in God makes you not generous? I mean, uh, it's possible. I don't know. It's really an interesting question, but that's not the topic for today. The, t the topic is how do people answer the question, do I believe in God? Well, you might answer that differently in different places. You know, if you're on the day that your confirmation is held and you show up at the church and all your relatives are there and, and you know, your, your uncle or aunt asks you, do you believe in God? You might say yes, right? But, uh, you know, at the end of the weekend, after all the partying, you know, you might confess to your cousin, well, I don't really believe. So, so it also depends on those kinds of conditions. Um, you know, do a lot of these questions are stupid. You've taken these surveys. Well, you know, you've taken dumb surveys, I'm sure. You know, do you do the right thing? Do you try to do the right thing all the time? No, none of the time. No, I'm better than that. I'm even better than 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 sometimes. I try to do the right thing most of the time. Right? So, so this one's a four, right? And so everybody's doing this, right? You, know, you get a range, and then you tabulate all the numbers, and then, uh, and then you, you figure out all, all the young people today, you know, between the ages, you define it, between the ages of 18 and 24, all the young people today, uh, 3.74 uh, on the scale of one to five, do try to do the right thing, you know, uh, and and that's an improvement from the previous generation. Twenty years ago, it was only three point five, right? Uh, and it looks like it's real data. It's objective. Well, how can you have objective when everybody's answering the crazy question in with all these a big word in ethnomethodology, all these local contingencies? are running the show. You know, a one local contingency was how they got the right to vote for women in Japan. Our world is local contingencies, and the researcher misses it, especially survey researchers, because survey researchers are just counting people. They call themselves sociologists, but they never leave their offices for Pete's sake. I used to have a rule that I would not sit on any doctoral committee of a student who did not travel at least two blocks from campus to do their research. And, and they considered me hard-nosed for that policy because they just want to download the data off the internet. But what data are they downloading? Nonsense. They're downloading, they don't know where the data came from. Yeah, but it's you know, it's all these numbers, they're all objective. Well, are they objective? You know, you have a United Nations researcher going out to every country of the world, you know, they go to uh, uh, Michael Mormon, a, a conversation analyst, ethnomethodologist, wrote a great book called Talking Culture, uh, and he describes this story about going to, uh, I think, it wasn't, might have been Guatemala might have been Guatemala, I can't remember, in one of the Central American countries. Um, and the, this United Nations researcher was going and studying, uh, you know, do, can you develop an economy in a place where people don't know how to defer gratitude, right? It was like a social psychological study, to defer gratitude, uh, uh, defer, defer, I mean, that's not the way. <laughs> to, 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 to defer uh, uh, gratification, to defer being satisfied. You know, if you're gonna, if capitalism is gonna work, you're going to, uh, you're gonna have to not spend your money. Aboriginal people can never be successful in the capitalist system because they give everything away to their friends. I mean, they, they do that. They like doing it. It's not a problem for them. 
but to make capitalism work, you have to not give things away. You, you have to, to accumulate. They actually passed a law in the United States in 1937 or, no, no, that was too late, 27. Uh, yeah, but before FDR. Uh, they passed a law making it illegal for American Indians to give things away because they wanted them to develop capitalism and they realized they couldn't do it, right? So he, deferred gratification, that's what he says. Yeah. So, so can people, if they save their money and don't, don't spend it now, then they'll have money to reinvest and then it'll grow and they'll become rich and be a lot better off in the long run, right? You get this advice, I'm sure, and there's a lot of Lutherans in, in Denmark, right? Uh, maybe. I, I know a few. Uh, and, uh, and this is a good, good Lutheran policy, okay? So this guy's tromping around. I mean, the first problem he has, the first local contingency this UN researcher has in Guatemala, it's raining all the time, and none of his pens are working, right? You can't get the pens to, to work, right? Uh, so he finally solves that problem, and then he trips out again. And he has a surveys that he's giving to each village, and he's got with him uh, people who speak the local Indian language. So he's got some language adequacy, hopefully, right? Uh, and they ask him, uh, they ask each, each person a series of questions. One of the questions is, if I gave you a new car now, would you take the new car now? Or if I told you if you Turn it down now, and two years from now, I would give you two new cars. Which would you do? Would you take the new car now, or wait two years and get the two cars? Okay. These people, he had to hike a day from the nearest road up to these mountain areas, and there's a bit of overpopulation, so they're having problems uh, finding farm space for the offspring. As their children grow up, they need their own land to farm. And and they're trying to grow corn and, and some other crops. And uh, they need space to grow land. The guy is thinking, my god, I don't, have, I don't have a way to get the car here, for one thing. And if it was here, I wouldn't have a place to put it. And it's going to take up more space. I won't be able to grow any crops where, where the car is and where, where the road is. It's going to, that road over the driveway is what's really going to kill me. And so, he, uh, he says, I don't want the car now, okay? So he gets marked off as, as someone not, uh, uh, who is capable of deferring gratification. Someone else thinks a little more deeply and says, oh my God, uh, it's gonna take up all the space I have. Uh, I won't be able to, to, to plant those, those potatoes after all. Um, Oh, but if I have to choose between one car and two cars, I'll choose one car. One car is better than two cars. And so he says one car. So he gets categorized the, the other way as someone who can't defer gratification. And all these things get tabulated. The people disappear, right, in the report. These are just populations that these sociologists, these social psychologists are studying. Rather, ethnomethodology is not interested in studying populations. We're interested in studying people, and not just people, that's a general category. What is it about the people that we're studying? We are studying what is social about those people. How do they interact with other people? What are the social orientations? How are they looking at the situation to figure out how they're going to get along? What is the most social part of their lives? They work and live together as a cooperative exercise. They're not individuals that stand apart, anonymous. And why wouldn't sociology study that? We had one of the most famous sociologists in the country come to, wanting to come to our department. God knows why. He, he was a, a demographer, and he was known for his uh, groundbreaking studies of fertility throughout the world. And, you know, they're dealing with issues like, like how do you prevent overpopulation in the third world? You know, kind of a similar interest in some degree. And, and he came and, and I said, well, have you ever done any field work in the third world? He says, oh, yes. I said, oh, good. Uh, which country? 
He said, Thailand. I said, uh, how long did you spend in Thailand? He said, two months. Two months? That, I, I mean, to figure out how a woman, young woman makes a decision on birth control, you know, two months. And, and I said, do you speak Thai? No, but we had really good translators. OK. OK. Uh, I said, did you ever leave Bangkok? He says, yes. For one week, we took a trip to a nearby village. Okay, so imagine. I mean, this is this is the uh, the the survey researcher doing the surveys of young women on fertility issues who hasn't a clue of what a young Thai woman is thinking about. How are they ever going to come up with research? They don't know where their data comes from, and also they're not interested in where their data goes. I'm sure he would be very happy if the results of his findings could help set a national policy that would, that would maybe reduce the birth rate of Thailand. Uh, but he says, that's not my business. I'm objective. I'm a professional. I'm just doing the research. Just, just, uh, uh, just the facts is all I'm interested in. So that's very peculiar. I mean, to, to, that's an ethical problem. Not, I think everybody should do their work wanting to help people, okay? But that's not part of ethnic methodology. In fact, I'm criticized. <laughs> but, but that's part of the Buddhism. <laughs> but, but never mind. I mean, that's not the important thing for today. The important thing for today is that he doesn't know where it's coming from. He doesn't know what the data means. You don't know what the answers mean unless you know what the life world is of the people giving the answers, unless you know what those answers mean for them. And you don't know that unless you spend some time. And time is what no one has. You know, my students say, I just want to finish my research. I just want to get out of here. Right? Uh, but, you know, we have to, we want to get the, the paper written, uh, you know, before the holiday. Uh, we don't want to spend all the holiday writing the paper. Or it is the holiday, and you're writing the paper on the holiday, and you have to get the paper by the time the holiday, holiday ends, because it's due or because the, the, the editor wants it. And so you don't take the time to figure out what it is people are really thinking, because figuring out what people are really thinking is very hard. First of all, you have to be quiet and listen. And that takes a long time. And people don't reveal themselves right away. So it's a, it's, it's a harder kind of research to do. But I think it's more objective. They say, no, no, that's too subjective trying to figure out what people really think. That's totally subjective. Tr trying to figure out nothing is, on the other hand, very objective. And there's a great book by Theodore Adorno on negative dialectics where he talks about how in our contemporary research we've switched completely objective and subjective. What's subjective is more objective and what's objective is totally subjective. But anyway, we'll, we'll save that for, for another day. Um, I mean, people, the researchers don't know a lot of the time what they're doing. Uh, uh, years ago, my wife and I went and spent two months in Samoa. 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 There's two Samoas. There's independent Western Samoa, and there's American Samoa. And we find ourselves in a village where uh, an old guy came and said, uh, said that, oh, yes, uh, you're a sociologist. Well, well, Margaret Mead lived here. Now, how many people know who Margaret Mead is? Who, who, who is Margaret Mead? Uh, what? Psychology. It could be psychology. But, 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 but you know what she's famous for? Uh, ethnography. Eth ethnography? Yeah. And which ethnography? Uh, <laughs> oh, you, well, you want to read this book. The name of the book is Coming of Age in Samoa. Bali? Not Bali. Uh, Samoa. I met her a couple times at conferences. She... Look, uh, you... you your life would not be the same today if it wasn't for Margaret Mead. She changed your life in, in two important ways. 
One way is she was in a world run by paternalistic anthropologists. She showed the world that a woman could be an anthropologist just as well. Okay, and that really made a difference. But the other thing is, you know, she she did her research right after World War II, and uh, she grew up in the 30s when Freud was what everybody read. And so she read a lot of Freud. And she had a critique of American culture, which was that everybody was uptight sexually, that people needed to be more free. And when she went to Samoa, she discovered that people in Samoa, especially young people in Samoa, would make love as much as they like with anybody they like. And it wasn't immoral. It was moral. And so she wrote this book, Coming of Age in Samoa, which scientifically demonstrated that there was the possibility for some human cultures to have more open sexual lives and for it to be moral and not immoral, right? That's a big step. She took Freud and turned it into some anthropology. And once people read this book, they said, oh, so we don't have to be uptight after all, right? And then, lo and behold, you know, we had the whole sexual revolution. That's a big change, which you are all experiencing, I, I'm sure. So we owe Margaret Mead a lot, except, so I was surprised. Here I am in the village where Margaret Mead did some of her research. I said, well, tell me, you know, I met Margaret Mead. I, I know her. Uh, what was she like? And she said, he, he said, well, she was always asking questions about sex. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? Uh, uh, and uh, did you answer those questions frankly? Uh, this was in American Samoan, so we spoke English. I could talk freely. Uh, and he said, well, you know, we answered the questions, but we made a lot of the stuff up because, because she, she loved hearing these stories so much that, that we, we made up more stories than were true. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, you know. I mean, so that's a, that, you can follow that under the problems of doing interviews, okay? <laughs> Better just to go and be quiet. Um, but they're still, still going to tell, tell you what, what they think you want to know. Okay, the problem with, with surveys is body counts versus people uh, being social. Um, uh, if you read Durkheim, he talks about the difference between the sum of individuals and the, the new sociality. He wrote this fabulous book, the most important book ever written in sociology, called The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, where he describes how people uh, develop social solidarity, how they create, what they're really after, what religion is really about, is the solidarity and the collective feelings of good vibes. He called it collective effervescence that people experience when they come together and engage in religious rituals. And that that's what was sacred, that it was the sociality. So people, when they come together, become an, almost a different species, like a quantum leap, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. I'm sure when I mean, you go to your, to your confirmation, um, why is everybody there if they don't believe in God? Uh, it amazes me. That, I mean, all my colleagues in Culling and Udinser are going to these confirmations in the spring, and, uh, and, and none of them believe in God. And they say, well, you know, it's, it's important, okay? And it's important for the ways that you're kind of God. But the, the point is that, that they're not just individuals. We live off the social feelings that, that create. So why don't, how do sociologists study that? I mean, how can we study feelings? Only if we turn them into numbers. But does that capture them? Okay, another way to work are experiments. We design experiments. I mean, we had the breaching experiments in, in ethnomethodology. I mean, uh, uh, giving people a hard time to discover, or not deliberately violating rules in order to discover what rules are. But in fact, uh, experiments are also very distorted. Um, 
Um, you have uh, you have in linguistics. Well, they used to do interviews, but now now they bring computers around, and they they have they have computing computer programs that people respond to and certain proper protocols for eliciting grammatical moves in a given language. And, and if you go to any linguistics department in the world, and they're going to be doing research based on programs that people sit down at a computer and answer these questions about the language that, that people speak. You know, if they, if they speak Hmong, you know, from, from Laos or something, uh, they're asking them about that. And they're trying to discover the structures of languages. Um, but I'm, I'm a social linguist, right? Language and, and social interaction is part of the courses and research I do. And one of the most important things I've discovered is that when you use language, you have to have both a speaker and a listener. Where did the listeners go? The linguists are only studying the speakers. You know, when, when, uh, when the linguists go off to, uh, to Queensland, I've seen them, I've met them, you know, the first thing they do is they set up a tent, right? It's hot, and they're going to be interviewing dozens. Let's say there's, there's 25 surviving speakers of an Aboriginal language. So you want to nail that grammar down before they die, because it's not going to be reproduced. So you need to elicit the grammar. So you have your protocols. You don't speak a word of the language. You have no idea what it is to speak the word of the language. Part of the language is signing, and you don't even have a way to record that in your data. And, but what you do, you set up your tent, and, uh, and you, you give each one some, some used clothes, because the Aboriginal people expect that. I'm not sure whether they really want the used clothes or whether they accept the used clothes because, because they think that's what the researcher wants them to accept. I mean, that's really an interesting situation. It's very complicated. They certainly want the tobacco. They probably prefer beer. Um, I used to get beer. <coughs> they want a beer, I'll give them a beer. Uh, but, you know, I was uh, way in the outback. And I had a cold fridge in my Land Rover, right? That was that may be very popular among Aboriginal people. Anyway, you know, but we'd run out of beer and then we'd have to uh, sell for the tobacco. Uh, I mean, you know, they're coming in for the tobacco and they're coming in for the clothes, and then they're sitting down and they don't know what this guy wants, and so they try to figure out as best they can what he wants and give it to him. But now they do it all with computers. But. Where are the listeners? How do you capture the life of a language without capturing the social aspects of using language? I want to know, I mean, Aboriginal language is the most beautiful language I've ever heard. And their expressive capacities, maybe because they don't read, is, is greater than any I've ever heard. One thing they do better than other people is they listen well to people who are speaking. So not capturing that is really to miss part of what they do best. I learned the Aboriginal language in one year, which is the fastest I've ever learned a language. I speak a few languages, none of them really well, but I speak Italian and Spanish, a teeny bit of French, Tibetan I speak fairly well, um, and I speak the Aboriginal well, but not because I'm so good. They're just good listeners. You know, my Spanish is very good in Argentina where people are half Italian, I'm half Italian, so they, they get me, right? I use the, I use the prosody right. Uh, um, in parts of Mexico, it's a completely different rhythm to their speech, and they can't hear me at all. So am I fluent in Spanish? It depends on who's listening. Ha ha. There you have it. It's a collaboration between hearer and, and speaker. Uh, on the other hand, the Tibetans don't want to speak Tibetan to anybody. They'd rather keep the language in English if they know English, because they're very protective of their privacy. If you you keep it in the foreigner's language, you're not going to get an insight into your own life. 
So, so I had to go find a Tibetan community where nobody spoke English, which I finally found, and after that I finally found Tibetan. But in one case I was fluent in a year, in another case it took 10 years, simply because of the capacity of people to hear me. Because, because people make sense of what you're saying, and you can get by, and you're very happy, and you're sometimes stunned at, at, at being able to pull off a foreign language. Uh, so uh, the problem with the, with the linguists then is that they use these experiments, and the experiments are tightly controlled situations, which are designed from the horizon of meaning of the life world of a professional academic. You need in your research design, you need to come up with some place where what you don't know can appear and be witnessed. You need the indigenous people, or the people you're studying, the groups you're studying, you need some place for them to be original and to capture something new. Garfield used to call it news. You know, the, the real reason we're doing research is to learn what we don't know. If we already know, why are we doing the research? That doesn't change the fact that when you apply for a grant, you're going to have to tell them exactly what it is you're going to find out. Right? And the methods you're going to use, which is against one of the fundamental principles about the methodology, which is don't, you don't know the method until you, get, until you arrive in, on the scene. Because you don't know what are the ethnomethods people are using. We don't have methods as ethnomethodologists. All we're doing is describing what they're doing. That is, we're identifying what they're doing and then describing what they're doing. So the phrase in ethnomethodology is every method is uniquely adequate to the occasion that we're studying. So you can't use the same method twice. It's like snowflakes because people are like snowflakes. They're not all the same. Well, we gotta use the standard accepted methodology because everybody's the same. Garfinkel was part of a research group into how jurors uh, organize their thinking and make decisions. Uh, part of a, the early part of decision sciences uh, in Chicago. And they tape recorded jurors, you couldn't do that now, but Back in the 50s, you could get away with back with anything. And, uh, and they analyzed those tapes. And uh, one of the giants of, of statistical methodology, uh, this guy Bales, uh, said, uh, said, no, it was actually, it, Bales was on the team. It was actually Fred Sturmbach who said, uh, I've learned from this study what it is of jurors that make them small groups. I have yet to learn what it is of jurors that make them jurors. <coughs> it's a good criticism. So what we want to do is, if we want to study the uniquely identifying ethnomethods, right? If, you, if we want to capture what, what makes Aboriginal people Aboriginal people, then let's capture what they're doing and that may require waiting until we see what they're doing. To know ahead of time what they're doing is really just another form of imperialism. And it becomes paternalistic when you think you know everything and your, your subjects don't know anything. You call them subjects. Right? And you've you got these, these appellates with buttons on, on your, on your, on your uh, standard wardrobe. So, you, I mean, the, 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 well, I'm, I'm in these 20 books, in many of the more general anthropological ethnographies, there was always a chapter on the Aboriginal rituals. Now, I participated in a number of Aboriginal rituals, and uh, they're really interesting. Um, and they have some drawings that they do in red ochre, and they also have some scarring that they do that are designs uh, related to totemic beings. And you get these long descriptions in the anthropological literature. Oh, the scarrings are between so many meter, so many centimeters and that, so many centimeters, and they're, they're 
more on the back than on the front, and, and some people have this kind and some people have that kind. You could, you could waste a weekend reading all the details, anything that could be counted or abstracted from, from the scrawling or the painting, you could, you could read about. But what you don't capture are what does it mean for the Aboriginal people doing the rituals. It's fabulous. They go all night long, and the the utter cries that are used make, make you make tears come to your eyes, even though you don't know what it means. But you're dying to find out what it means. I never did, and I read all these anthropological studies hoping to find out. Do you, can you imagine in a hundred years of Australian Aboriginal anthropology, nobody's figured out what they're doing in their rituals? I mean, you could. You could fill a shelf on the library with their research. And they never bothered to probe deeply enough to find out what it was they were really doing. Um, I had a strategy for doing that, but then I got carried away with Tibetans and, and never went back. Um, but what's worthwhile about our work is that we discover things that people don't know. And we discover the looks of the world from four other people. This is so rewarding. And in the social sciences, you, you, you maybe haven't appreciated well enough that you're not going to be rich or famous if you're going to be a social scientist. Isn't that too bad? Uh, <laughs> but, but so you don't have to worry about being a, a big success because it, it's not going to pay off very big. Uh, you might as well have fun. And I really urge you at this young stage to to insist on enjoying your research. If the, you don't enjoy it, find something else. It'll end up paying more, I'm sure. OK, I don't want to dampen their enthusiasm. <laughs> but I mean, Garfinkel, uh, the founder of Ethnomethodologist, uh, when he was in his 90s, at the end of his life, apologized to me. I said, what are you apologizing for? He said, well, I, I, I sold you this bill of goods that's only, only made you poor. And uh, I said, no, my life has been the greatest life I could possibly have had. I looked at all these people. I figured out all these things. I figured, I'm studying how people make sense of the world, how they construct reality. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's certainly uh, full payment. OK, uh, I'm going a little slow. Uh, uh, yeah, if you want to have a break. No? But they might. Do you want to have a break? Little break? Yes. Let, let me go for about 10 more minutes okay. and try to set up, because I'm going to show some data after the break. Yeah. And I haven't gotten that far. Um, the, what we're interested in is in capturing. So what method do we use to capture the naturally occurring phenomena? We try, wherever possible, to use videotape. Because what's going on, as several people said, is so complicated and so, so intricate and so full of local details that we can't see the local details, not fast enough to write about it. And so, and, and if you do write, you have to write before you go to sleep uh, because you'll forget most of it by the next morning. Okay. Um, uh, if, if you write it the same day, even though you're tired, you'll, you'll remember about half. If you wait till the next morning, you're down about 10 or 15 percent. Uh, but better than writing is to, is to video record, because then you can see it again and again and again. So we, we try to capture ordinary interaction. Um, <clears throat> and that's led us to an incredible discovery, which has shaken the foundations of social science, and that is Mostly in the past, social microsociologists, social psychologists have reduced what people are doing to concepts. And that's how phenomenologists work. They try to reduce it to concepts and ideas that people have. It turns out we discover on the tape. A lot of the time, people don't know what they're doing. It's not clear to them what they're doing. So if we're supposed to record what they're doing, what? to provide the local orderliness, what if it's not ordered at all? What if they're still confused at the end of the day? 
if we're going to be objective, our ethnography has to reveal and describe that confusion. But you won't read an article like that because the researcher will rewrite the confusion as order, as a narrative skill. Okay? You want to capture whatever they're doing. That's the phenomenology. So the, what's on the tape is fabulous. Uh, you, you see a lot of what people are doing is also ordered, but not conceptual. It's preconceptual, it's post-conceptual, it's embodied, they're producing and observing. Mostly, they're not producing anything. Producing is like a dangerous word to use. The creation, the construction of reality, the producing of local order. It's a dangerous word to use because it buys into the enlightenment, the myth of the enlightenment, that people always know what they're doing. The rational, uh, ethnocentric, logocentric, I know what I'm doing, I'm in charge of everything, uh, and everything is deductive, the decision sciences are full of this nonsense. Right? Yeah. Pe people don't know clearly and distinctly what they're doing, and yet they're working with whatever coherence appears naturally. They find a coherence, they find a way of organizing a local situation, and they snag it. And it's crazy stuff. I mean, it comes up serendipitously. Serendipitous means being accidentally. Comes up, uh, and they all hop on and say, yes, this is how we're going to do it. You'll do this in your research. You won't know what sense to make of your data. And then at some point, you'll say, ah, this is, what, this is how we're going to do it. And then you, you all see it at the same time. But it's not that. Everybody planned way ahead of time. We did this research in order to discover such and such. And we did, we analyzed this aspect of it because we wanted to know. You didn't know any of that. Although when you write the, the report, you might say that you knew. But in fact, a lot of things happen accidentally. People are opportunists. They find naturally arising order. And then they proceed with with naturally accountable phenomena. So the natural, I think you understand well. We look at what people do without being distorted by our designs. And then the accountable is, is a word that people trip over. There's two sense of accountable that we have to appreciate. The first sense is people verbalize a description or a formulation that explains or describes what we're doing in this situation. Right now, uh, you know, we're not watching television, we're having dinner. We are having dinner. And that, that is an account. And it also helps to found a local order. So when, as a way to solve any confusing situation, people put words to how everybody is supposed to make sense, and they verbalize those ways so other people can hear them. And having heard them, they can get on the same page. And there you have your local order. So that's one sense of accounts. Accounts as summaries for what we're supposed to be doing. Another sense of accountable is the notion of that people will be held accountable for what it is that they're doing with their lives, for how they're behaving at the dinner table. So, so you, you know you're going to be held accountable to comply with the expectations, but you don't know what those expectations are. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So the, the word accountable is not only providing some account, but also an orientation to how other people are going to accept or reject what we do. So we're, we're, we're acting in the language we use, in the tone of voice, in the spacing. You know, let's say I'm having dinner. Uh, you know, I, I don't know uh, Denmark. I've only had dinner at a few houses. And when I'm sitting at the d dinner table, you know, it's a, at least in America, the question is, are we going to say grace before we have our meal? You know, if you're at a home which always says grace, you don't want to be diving into the potatoes w before people have said grace, right? And you also want to let people think that, oh, yes, of course, I always say grace. Everybody says grace, don't they? It's, 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 it's a given. 
So you're sitting there wondering, you know, but then it's not if you're at a place where nobody's ever says grace, uh, to kind of like, like, expect to say grace is like, is like not being very cool, right? Kind of like being old fashioned. Uh, and so when people just dive into the food, you, you go dive into the food as though that's, of course what people do is, is you, you dive into the food without saying grace. You know, I don't say grace, who says grace anymore? That is, you can go any way the wind blows. And a lot of life is like that. And you're sitting there on the fence waiting for some indication because you're going to be held accountable for doing it wrong. And you don't want to do it wrong, but you don't know whether you're supposed to say grace or not say grace. So you really uh, are very adept at, at, like a chameleon, fitting in. And that's how local order is established. So we'll take a break, and uh, I'm going to set up some video so you can see what looking at video is. I'm going to show you I don't know, about four examples of people uh, providing accounts, doing accounts, uh, and give you a bit of a model. We're not big on models in the methodology, but I've come up with a model. Very dangerous thing to do. Uh, but I think it helps students understand. OK, thanks for your attention. 10 minutes, so 11 o'clock. The, uh, I want to first start with, with a transcript, a very brief transcript. Um, I'm doing this research on coffee tasting, and the, this was from some data collected by my students of uh, college-age people evaluating coffee in the uh, cafe close to our university. Um, and I said to you that, in fact, uh, people don't know what they're doing a lot of the time. At least they don't know what they're doing as much as both the researcher and the people themselves think they know what they're doing. Okay. Um, and I, want, I also wanted to talk about how it was a bias of the Enlightenment that people do know what they're doing. The whole, I, the whole argument of John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and all these wonderful thinkers who gave us our ideas of civil liberties and stuff uh, presumed that there was something like a social contract where people you know, voluntarily thought through society and agreed to give up some rights for, for some privileges. But there was no social contract. I mean, people were already thrown into a system. And the notion of a tabula rasa, a blank slate, is just a theorist's device. Uh, That's not to say that the civil liberties aren't wonderful. Uh, but the, the just so story that, uh, that Locke and Rousseau tell about how things, people happen, People don't know everything that they do. They, they do, and then they find out afterwards uh, what it is they know. Um, and even the phenomenologist, uh, Husserl, starts with individual consciousness. Uh, the famous dictum of Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. We all start with the I. That's not really how it happens. You know, it's the chicken and the egg that pick the egg. Uh, it it's, needs to be transformed into we think, therefore we are. That's a little more accurate, because human species are a species being. Mark said that part right. So to, to, to show you, you know, the problematic uh, way in which, say, rational choice theory would describe things, as people maximizing their, their uh, benefits and minimizing their risks. Uh, people you know, would do that if they knew what, their, what the benefits were, or they knew what the risks were, but a lot of times they don't. Um, and a lot of time, Husserl says that we have to start with original evidence. How do people, how does the mind put things together? We're trying to figure out how we construct the meanings the Sinnbildung is the German word. How do we put the meanings together into a coherent system? And 
you kind of assume that you add one idea to another idea and you build it up. But it's not really like that. It's, it's much more hermeneutical the situation, but that's, that's another class. What we're trying to, to promote here in ethnomethodology is that what's original is the group situation, that thinking is a public activity. It's not just a, uh, a, an individual, totally thought out, rational uh, activity. That a lot of times, the social demands and the social agreements take place before people really know what it is that they're committing themselves to. And this, this uh, example, in a very brief way, demonstrates that. Two, you have two students, A and B, and a student interviewer. And one student said, there's actually a third, a third student tasting, but didn't say anything. Um, the, the one student was drinking and says, it's definitely bold. That's his account. Okay, it's definitely bold. Okay, uh, one thing I've learned is whenever anybody used the word definitely, it means they don't know. If, if, they, if they really were definite, they just say it's bold. Right? It's definitely bold. They're trying to, to psych themselves up for believing what they're saying. Right? So that immediately is a suspicious comment. And then his friend agrees it's a very bold coffee. That's a confirmation. Right? You get the account. It's definitely bold. It's a very bold coffee. So um, I like to uh, remind my students that just because two people agree on something doesn't make it true. Right? It takes three people before truth begins. Okay? When the third person comes in with bold, then it'll be solid. And then you get into this, this moral obligation to believing that what you said is true. Right? But at this point, it's just these two. And then B is encouraged and says, I definitely agree with the boldness. Okay? I definitely agree with the boldness. Okay, and then they talk about some other aspects. And then B tries to summarize, and a lot of times in an interaction, people will give a summary account. He says, it was really sour, bitter, too strong, but bold. Okay. Uh, and, you know, they've learned how to talk in the acceptable way. And so the interviewer, since we're doing a study of coffee tasting, the interviewer cleverly asks, what do you mean by bold, right? And then, the, surprised by that, the, the, the person who said bold said, he was the one that said bold. No, he was the one that just agreed to the bold. He was the one that convinced you that what you said was absolutely true. Uh, how is bold? So here, they come to an agreement about bold, it gains some status in the assessment of the coffee, and they don't know what bold is. They've agreed to something that they don't yet know what it is. And that, you may be thinking right now, oh, well, the weird things like this do happen from time to time. I, I recognize that. But I may suggest to you that most of it's like this, that it's very rare that we really know the meaning of what we've agreed to in a social interaction. In fact, the reason we carry out the social interaction is to find out what the meaning is of what we agreed to. It's like, and has anybody heard of the woman Nancy Pelosi? Okay. Uh, more than Margaret Mead, anyway. But uh, Mar they're both very good, but Margaret Mead I would, I would probably recommend first. Um, Nancy Pelosi was uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States, and now she's the head of the Democratic Caucus in the House of Representatives. She's a very savvy politician. I like her very much. Uh, but um, she speaks her mind, and so she doesn't have a lot of people uh, on her side. Uh, but when they were passing Obamacare, which is the medical coverage for people that didn't have medical insurance, you don't know much about that here in Denmark, but there are a lot of poor people without medical coverage. 
in the U.S., and Obama was trying to get that medical coverage. And he succeeded for about 8 million people, uh, which is not nothing. Um, it's a little less than the calamity that you read about in the news, but, uh, but at least it's something. And people were saying, well, this bill is too big. It's this high. And, and you're trying to rush it through so that you can be passed by the Congress before the next election, right? Because then there'd be a new Congress. Uh, you, you were run, we, no one has even read it. You know, they typically don't read the, the, the bills. They're written by staff people. Um, but, but this one was so long, the, the big complaint was nobody knows what it means. And even, I've read it, and I don't know what it means. We can't pass something we don't know what it means. And Nancy Pelosi says, what do you mean you can't pass something that you don't know what it means? We do it all the time. You have to pass it in order to discover what it is it means. That's where you find out what it means, is when they start implementing it, only then do you know what it really means. Well, they took that and you know, made her look stupid and attacked her. But in fact, that was a pretty accurate statement of how the world works. So this is not an exception. So I want to give you a typology for, uh, for how uh, it can possibly work. Well, let me go into uh, a larger version. Well, it's not really larger. Um, I have this model to how these things work. People are trying to figure out what they're doing, whatever the doing is. If you're moving a forklift, uh, if you're trying to coordinate forklift movers so they don't run into each other, it's a bit like bumper cars sometimes. Um, or if you're, uh, you know, if you're doing an auction, right? Uh, you know what an auction is, a public auction. Uh, uh, do I hear 50, do I hear 50, 51, 50, 55, 55, do I hear 60? Do I hear 60, 60, 60, 65, right? And the speaker is giving the account for everybody, okay? Well, people are like that, except, except you know, it's a little more democratic. There's not one guy giving the account. Oh, so sometimes there is. Uh, that's the loud mouth, right? Uh, the, the accounts are formulated so that everybody can see what people are doing, so that there can be an exhibit of what's happening. And everybody seeing the exhibit can then respond in a way that conforms with how people are doing it. So you get a candidate account, and people will say, no, that's not at all. It's not bold. It's on the, on the contrary. It's very smooth. So then you get a difference. Right? Or you get a confirmation. Right? In, in that case, we got, oh, yeah, it's very bold. So a lot of accounts don't survive unless you get its con a confirmation. And this goes in a very crazy way. It's unbelievable. Oh, I want to go to a movie That's, uh, on Saturday. Uh, well, what movie should we go to? Well, I want to see this, this new movie. Uh, um, there's some new movie about Argentina that I'm really interested in. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, well, anyway. The, Let's say I want to go to to the movie. Let's say there's two movies on Argentina, okay? And I want to go to this new movie in Argentina. And the other other person says, "Yeah, I wanted to see that too. I'm really interested in uh, in anything that has cowboys in it." And and I'm thinking, "No, no, I wanted the detective story. I didn't want the cowboy one." And I'm just about to correct the other person when. The third person goes, uh, yeah, that's OK. Uh, so you have the first person making a, a suggestion, and the second person uh, confirming it, and the third person confirming the confirmation. Except that that the first person knows that that, that movie was not the movie that they meant. And in fact, that person really didn't want, want to go to that uh, Argentine cowboy. They were wanting to go to a ro romantic movie. But because the other person suggested it, they acted politely and said, yeah, I'd like to go to that too. And then the third person didn't have any idea at all, but figured that if the two people agreed that 
they in fact would uh, would go along. Okay, uh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so the first person just as the point that he was about to correct the second person's uh, comment, the third person jumps in with her agreement, and so the first person decides, oh, well, if those two have agreed, I should probably go along. So the result of it is they all agree. They use some coordination to come to an agreement about what movie they see, and they all end up going to a movie that none of them want to see, thinking that that's what everybody wants. That, that is how, this is a structure that people use for getting on the same page, but they get tangled in the circumstantiality, in the circumstantial details of the structure, and can't pull it apart in time to find out what they were really thinking. Anyway, so you get these accounts, you get uh, these confirmations, and then it's not enough that you just confirm it, as I said, you need three people before you can reach truth. You get an, a point at which the, the agreement becomes an object that stands like a Durkheimian social object for everybody. That, oh yeah, we all agree, you know, um, the coffee's bold. Uh, and, and nobody who, who disagrees would dare voice that disagreement. Or they would prefer not to voice the disagreement. Because it stands as almost a matter of fact by the point it's objectivated. So I'm very interested, this is actually a term that Husserl developed that was extended by Alfred Schutz, the social phenomenologist, and his student Harold Garfinkel uses it in his dissertation. And I use it a lot as well. Because it's different than just a confirmed account. It's when the confirmed account starts to stand independently of the people who produce it. And in fact, they don't produce it because nobody produced that we're going to go to the Argentine cowboy. It just kind of produced itself. So Garfinkel says that events are self-organizing. People say, what are you talking about, Harold? You know, well, they are self-organizing, not like anybody wanted to go to the movie. So, but then there's a fourth stage, which I won't talk a lot about today, but it's also very interesting. And that's when everybody agrees to forget the fact that they just produced the decision. That it stands completely independent. They kind of detach themselves. They disengage themselves from the process of producing that social object. Even though, yeah, they produced it. And the amnesia is critical because you want, you want to pretend, kind of like the way my, the librarian I had in the sixth grade pretended that every rule of the library dropped out of the sky and was kind of absolute. Um, you know, you had the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments, you know them, right? Uh, they, they came out of the sky, pretty much, and very important, very early. And shortly after that, I, as a sixth grader, thought, well, then you got these library rules. They're not as important as the Ten Commandments, but they also, nobody produced them. They're absolute, okay? Until I noticed one day that she just thought up a new one and treated them the same way. Then I decided I needed to be a sociologist and study how people do this, okay? So this is kind of what I call a model. I mean, it's just to help people understand. It's, it's, we're, we're not to now blindly, uh, in fact, we're not even to think we know what these words mean, but we look to the data for what people are doing. So I'm gonna show you a few examples. First, I'm gonna show you uh, some students playing a game with rules, and then I'm gonna show you uh, some Tibetans debating philosophy, and then I'm gonna show you some Italians tasting coffee. And we're going to look for where's the account, where's the confirmation, where's the objectivation, okay? Because, you know, these are things that become more clear when you see them in the real world. So, so, so that it's not abstract, right? Somebody said it was abstract, right? Uh, there's nothing, everything should be concrete in, when, in this kind of research. Okay, this is, is four of my students. Uh, they were told to do uh, not 
not uh, a blind date, but they were told to go and buy a game that nobody's ever played. And to turn the camera on just before you remove the cellophane off the outside of the game. And to record the reading of the rules, and to record a complete first run through of a play of a of a full game uh, of the play of a complete game and then you were to take that tape th throw it up on a computer and analyze it okay and for what are rules right very interesting i've had over several years i did this i had something like 40 groups of four students each uh, do tapes and papers, and uh, um, I have yet to have a group read all of the rules. People don't read rules. They read some rules. And it's fascinating uh, because rules are not intelligible. Rules are only intelligible when you start to play. It's like Nancy Pelosi said about the law. It's only when you play the rules that you know what the rules are talking about. Otherwise, you're forced to read page after page of unintelligible words. And, you know, a lot of times they don't make sense. You know, uh, it's like those instructions to, to kits that are, uh, that are produced in Japan. You, you presume that the Japanese didn't know how to write good English, right? When in fact, they did as best they could. It's just rules are not, instructions and rules are not intelligible until you have a world in which they collect their meaning. So they, they play the rules, and some rules, they're provided for in the rules. Here's what you try to do. You try to rule some of the rules so you can get started. But the person reading the rules very skillfully tries to read every rule that's important and never read a rule that's not important, okay? This is, on tape after tape, you see people reading through the rules, skipping some, reading others. If you don't know what the rules are, how on earth do you know which rules are important and which rules are not important? It's a distinction that you're making item after item as you go through the rules. This is important, I should read it. This is not important, I shouldn't read it. How would you know? It's fascinating, that skill. I mean, people kind of know, they do all right. Anyway, and then there are those rules that the rules don't even write about, because you can't write about everything. First of all, people don't have the patience since the rule writers know full well nobody's reading all the rules anyway. We're talking to ourselves mostly, right? It must be frustrating being a rule writer. And, you know, people, rules are both too complete and not not complete enough because very often you can't find in them a resolution to the problem that you've come upon. So you, you say, well, the rules weren't complete. You, you get the student comment, right? Or you, you get the comment, they're too complete. They're giving us all these details. We don't want to know that much. You know, we're not specializing in reading rules. I'll read something else if I'm going to read. So here's a rule about this guy's uh, playing with the dice, and he's got, he's tired of reading the rules, so he has a lot of pent-up energy, and he's going to let out all that energy on his roll of the dice. So she gives him in the, oh, here, let's go back. So his, he has a vigorous roll of the dice. So she's, she was a rule reader, one on the right, and she's wondering, what do we do if the die rolls on the floor? I mean, she's anticipating this guy is definitely doesn't have control of his rolling. So <laughs> if it rolls off the table, will we take whatever it is? Or will we, I mean, very few rules will specify that you know, it has to stay on the table. So that's for people to, to, to decide. And she's kind of like implying that it's it's a problem. So he says, well, if it's offensive, right, he's, it's like a candidate account that, well, we should, probably shouldn't count it if, if, it's, if it's offensive. 
And, but before he gets completed, she says, re -roll. She formulates the account. She formulates what the will will be. And then he hears her, and he confirms her re -roll. So you got the account, which is really here, although it's kind of setting it up there, and then you get the confirmation there. And then he observed, because he's a student doing a project on rules, oh, but this one is interesting. This one we're, we're making up. It's not in the rule book. Oh, well, we don't have the, uh, the sound. Yeah, I think it's, it's a bit better with sound. that up though and then then he says house rule of aggravation now the interesting thing about house rule of aggregation is you know what a house rule is I mean uh, you know it, 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 hard to know whether what we do in the states they do here but it's like you know when you go to a gambling casino uh, there's a lot of rules you know, for playing poker you, you use oil right but then you know they don't cover every rule and so the house has to come up with rules to make things orderly because you can't have a house where people are gambling and spending money. Uh, you can't have that uh, not be orderly because if people are losing money, you don't want to produce any grounds for complaint. So you have then the, the account is re-roll, the confirmation is re-roll, and then the house rule of aggravation is the objectivation of the rule. It's like, it's no longer now just us, it's like, it's like the nature of the place. It's like the house rule. And uh, it kind of makes a standalone status for the account that they developed. So that gives you a kind of example of, uh, of the model. And they, they then uh, sure. okay. So that means, okay, but I have to get a one in order to... To get to the super, yeah. right. so now you can just keep going around. Yeah. The, they're constantly trying to provide accounts for how do we play this game. And they're, they're, as they play, because they haven't read all the rules, because they couldn't figure out what they meant, uh, they're, they're continuously upgrading the rules. Are you sure? Five is a good number, right? <laughs> so, uh, so he, despite the fact that that he just was participant in a rule, he violated it. And over the course of the game, they all tried to violate it. Or if they didn't try to violate it, at least they they were very interested in what was it, you know. <laughs> and if it doesn't get a count, why would you be interested? Okay. <laughs> Okay, these are Tibetan student monks. They're, they're at the graduate level, uh, and they are studying uh, um, epistemology, I guess you'd say. Um, and so the, there's a person standing up. The person standing up has to pose a question. And uh, this little mark here indicates a hand clap. The hand clap is like this. I formulate a formal question, and when, it, when it's her time to answer, I go like that. And then she has to answer right away. She can't say, wait a minute, let me think. She has to either agree or disagree. And uh, that is a public way of presenting a formal uh, proposition. In this case, he, he begins with a preliminary uh, uh, observation. 
and that is the reflection of a face in the mirror in a continuum of an ordinary person is posited by the mind as erroneous. This is translated directly from the Tibetan. Um, that is the point that they're trying to talk about emptiness. Uh, and I don't have time to explain emptiness, but we'll talk about it. If you can come to my talk tomorrow, I'm going to present some Tibetan perspectives on the, the uses and limits of formal reasoning. Um, but one of the things they study is emptiness, and emptiness means the emptiness of having an essence. So that this pen doesn't have an essence. Uh, my, my pen doesn't have an essence, okay? Uh, it's a mixture of plastic and metal and some liquid on uh, coloring and all this together. It, for a temporary period of time, it has some being and I can write with it, but my pen really doesn't have the, you know, the platonic essence of penness from which it gets all of its truth. Okay. And especially the mindness of my pen doesn't have, the mindness doesn't exist in itself, although that's how we treat it. And so when they talk about emptiness, they're talking about the emptiness of the mindness and the emptiness of the penness. So you don't want to super believe. You, basically, it's a strategy for not believing your own propaganda, which is a very good thing. It's how you get to be open, right? Uh, don't believe your own propaganda, right? So, so emptiness, they're trying to show people who are used to believing everything they think, uh, they're trying to show them that things aren't always the way they appear. That is, there's a difference between appearance and reality. And an example is, when you look in the mirror, you don't believe that's a real person there. So you can see that even though the appearance is that it's a person, it's not a person, and that's a simple illustration for how we have to take every thought as something imaginary, some, like an image, rather than a, a, uh, a reality. So after he gets a preliminary uh, discussion, he then formulates it in the proper way, but he does it in a negative form. He does it in a negative form so that it's very clear to everybody what it is he's saying, what the proposition is he's saying. Because the point of doing an account is to communicate and to display so that other people can witness it. So he's, he's taking the negative form and then the person has to say no, not yes. He says, it does not follow that what you see in the mirror is real. And then, chi chir, it's, it's a way of saying no. And then, uh, then he, he says it in the positive way. So the lack of accord between the appearance of the reflection in the mirror is positive. So, so we do say that what appears in the mirror isn't real. So he says yes. Okay, so then he's, he's given the account and you get the confirmation and you've done it in a way that anybody in the room can follow, which is very different than how we do uh, philosophical discussions in the West. I mean, in the West, they're very obscure. They're, they're like two ships passing in the night. If you go to like a forensic debate, you know, there's one side talking for eight minutes and another side talking for eight minutes. It sounds like they never heard each other. Right? But here, they're forced to hear each other because they made it very clear. And then, having done that, he, he de develops it. And he takes that agreement and then, having achieved that accomplishment, uh, in the formal thinking, you then take that formal thinking that you're collaborating about together and you take it to the next stage. You make it more complicated and you keep inquiring into the nature of thinking by building up agreement by agreement what the problems of thinking are. Okay? So they are doing it in a, in a in a public way, which means they have to understand each other, and they understand each other by offering accounts and confirming accounts, and then in very clever ways, 
objectivating those accounts. So uh, we have then the, the second illustration. The third I want to do is, is coffee tasting. This takes place in Trento, Italy. Uh, and uh, she's saying it tastes a little to me like dark chocolate. Chocolate fondente. <laughs> She says, for me it tastes a little like peanuts, okay? He said, oh, let's say it's, it's like an oily seed. This oil is typical, let, let, let's look at the transcript. We always work with transcripts because they're, they're, it's easier to think. Uh, and when we do our analyses, uh, here's, here's the clue. You want a videotape, but you don't want to just watch the videotape. You want a transcript, but you don't only want to wa read the transcript. You want to read the transcript while listening to the video or audio. And you want to do that many times until you know what they're thinking better than they know. And for some reason, if you don't have the transcript, you can't see as much. And if you have just the Sanskrit, you tend to invent things that aren't there. And so the, the video will ground you into not going too far with your interpreting. Um, it's kind of like the electron mic microscope for ethnomethodology, using transcripts with videos or audios. So here, let's look at the transcript. He, she says, chocolate fondente, uh, it's dark chocolate. And that's a candidate account. That as she says it, even you can hear in the tone of voice, it's like putting up for other people's opinion. It's not, I'm definite, it's, it's chocolate. Chocolate is chocolate and Because of course, she's afraid of looking stupid. And this guy who's standing up is, uh, is the owner and roaster of this very fancy cafe. It's not fancy so much as really quality. You get really good coffee that he's blended himself and roasted himself. And he's very proud of every one of his blends. And so she's a little worried that if she doesn't say the right thing, he's going to come down on her head. So that's, this gets filed under she doesn't want to look stupid. Okay? So she says it a little tentatively. Dark chocolate. Okay? And then the second one goes, chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Okay? So she gets the confirmation. So you get the agreement and the confirmation. Mm, I don't think he's too happy about that. Uh, the, the, at least, I think probably in designing this blend and roasting it, he didn't, wasn't going for dark chocolate as the flavor. And he said, oh, very light tasting, like dark chocolate, being sarcastic. And, and then, and then she, he says, no, because I also said chocolate. It's like two people independently agree that it's chocolate. So even though maybe you're ridiculing uh, our assessment, we both agree. It, it's, it's got a chocolate to it. I mean, you got to just be objective. Uh, and then, then he kind of compromises and says, positive or negative, I don't know. You know. And then she tries to save the day and says, oh, positivo, positivo. Oh, no, I mean that in a, in a good way. And she says also, for me, it recalls peanuts. Okay. Then, uh, then the, the, the other woman says, oh, yes, the, the taste of peanuts. Uh, uh, it's just sort of expanding it. And then he summarizes it, offering a summary account, therefore always an oily seed. He likes that part because he was trying to get a coffee that was very full of oils. That's how the Italians like their coffee. That's what produces the crema. And which is very different than, than the Italian coffee, very different than the Scandinavian coffee. I, I love the Scandinavian coffee. They roast light. Uh, and the light uh, is, uh, you, you preserve more of the flavors, but you have to buy better beans. So it's a little more expensive way to do it. Anyway, uh, that, that's different, aren't you? <laughs> um, so he's saying, therefore, an oily seed. He's trying to provide an account 
that everybody can agree on and that the people can use to describe in an objective way the coffee that each one is tasting. You know, maybe I don't agree with peanut, maybe I don't agree with chocolate, but definitely it's an oily seed. Okay. And then somebody says, yes, that's the very flavor there. So they confirm the summary account, and then he provides the next stage, which is what I'm calling objectivation, and that is, so then, this oil here, and his tone, it goes from the tone of interaction to the tone of a professor, you know, telling everybody how it is. So then, this oil here is typical of the Italian extraction. Now, I can tell you as a researcher, estrazione uh, all'Italia, uh, all'Italiana is, is a myth, right? I mean, the definitive, all identities are myths. I mean, that's maybe the bad news of the, of, of the lecture, <laughs> right? I mean, we're studying identities. Uh, and George Herbert Mead, a different Mead, uh, studied how people construct their identities. And uh, you don't want to believe your identity. You, you need an identity or else you get lost and you develop what Durkheim called anomie. That is, you no longer know just exactly who you are. Uh, so we want an identity. We have a good identity. We want people to, uh, to respect us, so we feed our identity. You can do a study of how you do that on Facebook. You have not just one identity, you have four identities, right? Uh, so, so this work, this production that we've been talking about over here, of producing, you produce your identity. It's something that the Buddhists would say is also empty. How is my identity empty? What do you mean? I'm a I'm a professor, you know. Uh, I'm a father. That's my identity. Uh, it's objective. Well, if there was no children, uh, let's say, let's say my son dies, am I still a father? Let's say I was, I didn't have any kids. Would I be a father then? My fatherhood is dependent on the child. It's not. The, I mean, when you're a child, you think the motherhood of your mother is independent, right? Certainly, the grandmotherhood of my grandmother was independent. Look at all the grandchildren she had. She was grandmotherhoodness, you know, incarnate. But yet that was not in, in independently existing. So uh, in the same way, this notion like Italian extraction, we develop these myths for each other, but these myths are helpful to collect talk, to collect ideas about flavor. And so they'll go on for half an hour talking about what is the Italian extraction. And then people will say, yes, this is another uh, typical Italian coffee. Uh, this is the normal, right, that, that we're trying to, to identify. Although, you know, normal is different everywhere. It, it, how did things get normal? I asked my students, uh, uh, raise your hand, every one of you who speaks with an accent, right? And you'll get, you know, a third of the class raising their hands, you know? Well, what do the other two-thirds, what are they speaking? Without an accent, right? I mean, so, so, but, but we produce these ideas, and then we believe these ideas. You can produce the ideas because they're handy for organizing normal behavior, and they're handy for collecting thoughts so you can build up like the Tibetans were doing, but you should not believe that they're true. That's the point. And uh, that's where we go awry. We can use them, but have a very tentative hold of them. Be willing to let them go. And if you're able to let go your preconceptions, then the openness starts to happen. And you can discover new things. And that's, that's really tough. Uh, not believing your prejudices is really, really hard to do. Um, the um, the the, the uh, what's the time now? Okay. Um, well, um, I'll I'll skip I'll skip the last tape, which was going to show that final stage of of social amnesia, where uh, where the person uh, was uh, was 
treating things as apart from the production. Um, but that happens. Um, also, people get very tangled up in the details that are emerging. And they get so tangled up that they sometimes forget what it is that they were trying to do. Um, last month in Buenos Aires, I gave the students the task of going out and asking for directions and tape recording the directions. We had all these fabulous tapes of people asking for, how do I get to Lazama Park? Uh, you know, they, they were walking across town because they wanted to see part of the city. And the person said, oh, you just take the number 14 or the number 185 and get off at Puerto Street. Well, they had no intention of taking the bus. Uh, uh, but but then, then they started having a conversation about how will I know which street is Puerto Street if I've never been on the bus before. Uh, and uh, they got this long, entangled conversation that they should have just said, we're only walking. But we tend to get caught up in the local details and the circumstantial details of every conversation. And every interaction has these local details that end up running the show so that we're not running the show so much as the local details are. So what is our job? What is the methodology? that ethnomethodologists use, if we don't have methods, but are just looking at the ethnomethods, we are here to identify what are people doing to make sense of things. In this case, they are developing this summary of, of, of an oily seed and identifying that with typical Italian coffee. Um, and then we want to describe the methods that people are using. Coffee tasters have systems. People develop routines, so they're doing the same thing again and again. So our job is not to explain things. Our question really isn't why. Our question more frequently is how. Not what, but just exactly how do people uh, create things. And our main method is to just listen. Uh, in fact, the, the main wish you should have is that the people that you're studying will forget you're in the room. And to that degree, what they do is going to be natural to, to what they do. And you want to capture how they describe the local order and how they teach each other the local order. You know, people lining up in a queue for service, you know, in a line, uh, you know, don't just stand in line. They kind of instruct each other how this line is working. You know, when you go to a baker, every bakery has a different kind of line. Some of them have numbers. Some of them give preference to old clients. Um, but that line is very different than the line for the ATM. And then you get this very intricate work, is what is the proper space? You can't get too close because they have secret codes. And yet, yet the spacing varies greatly from, from country to country and from ATM line to ATM line. But here's the point to, to remember. Because the people themselves need to organize their affairs. They need to describe for each other, not for you, the researcher, but for each other, they need to describe what they're doing. They need to offer accounts that they need to offer accounts that that inform each other what they have to do. What are the expectations? How do we all get along? Because they have to teach each other how the local situation is being organized. The, you, as the researcher, can learn how to do it too. You don't have to ask questions. Just capture the work that they're doing. Just capture the ethnomethods that they're doing because they don't know how to do things perfectly. So you go and you visit whatever research site that you're, you, you have, and you just wait for them to do whatever they would do naturally. And if you're videotaping it, you don't even have to understand it while they're doing it. You can understand it later. And at times, if you're completely confused, you can go and ask the people what it was they were doing. But because they don't know what they're doing a lot of the time, you may not get an answer. 
Uh, my Tibetan research, I, I did many hours of, of debates that I transcribed in Tibetan and translated into English, and I still couldn't figure out what they were doing. So I would ask the people who were debating, they were friends of mine also, I said, what is it you're, why are you giving this argument? Well, what were you trying to do? And they look at it with fascination. Everybody loves to look at themselves. Great way to do research, right? You get their cooperation. But they say, I don't have a clue what I was thinking. That's very confusing. So you don't always uh, succeed in asking people for help. Um, but you can figure out most of it if you can get a tape of naturally occurring interaction. OK. that's. As good as I know how to introduce what is at the methodology. So, questions. We have at least five minutes, ten minutes, ten minutes for questions. We can always wait an audience by how many questions they ask. Nobody asks us. Yes, but be but be careful that that, that you know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> you know, but, but yeah, like your your students playing the game, you could say that it's also sort of an experiment or uh -huh. you know, made up situation, one way. So the, the important thing is that we look at situations as they are. You know, if you, uh, if you have people in an experiment that they are in an experiment, what are they doing in this experiment? And not what are they doing in a blind date? And, and the less you, the less questions you ask, the more, the less you'll distort it. You, you'll get the blind date for them instead of the blind date for you, because you'll end up having to write a report, the blind date for, for me, the researcher, and that's a different blind date. The, I, I had a student, very good student, who's now chair of the Department of Sociology at St. Louis University, and he did a wonderful uh, doctoral thesis on equality in marriage by interviewing couples and asking them what, whether they think equality in marriage is a good idea, and if so, how they, man how they plan to do it, I mean, how they manage to do it. Um, and he had you know, qu quite a few interviews, and then he did his, his report, a study of equality in marriage. I said, look, it's a nice study. It's fine, but it's it's not a study of equality in marriage, right? It's a study of talk about equality in marriage. To do equality in marriage, you know, you'd have to get into the kitchen to do your filming, right? Who's washing the dishes, right? Or or like Candy West did, you know, who's interrupting? During during the dinner conversation, you know, uh, uh, call me. No, no, no. It's the video. Oh. Well, I'll, just in case, I'll close that. Um, so uh, the um, I said, you know, it's a it's a fine dissertation, and in fact, the article he ended up writing for Human Studies is like. Well, I think for a while was the most downloaded article that human studies had, right? So, I mean, he did a serious piece of research, and he's a very successful uh, sociologist, but I said, title it what it is, a study of talk about, uh, and maybe you're interviewing them about a blind date, so you're studying talk about a blind date. You're not studying a blind date. You couldn't get the permission, right? I mean, you know, it, it, there's some things you can't study. Um, but be very clear what you are studying, because people delude themselves. I mean, you're not doing a study of, uh, of you know, uh, well, I mean, you could call it a fertility study, but if you don't know, uh, if you've never met a young woman, I mean, I don't know what you call that study. But anyway, they get the big bucks, yeah? 
Yeah, you had a question. Yeah. I was wondering um, about, you said it is so important to be open minded and um, let go of the old concept to see what other concepts we can find. But I mean, it's the other concepts I also, I mean, the next concepts I find, even though I'm open minded, they are empty as well, like the others before. Why should I let go of the old concepts to find out some new concepts? Where is the difference? Um, well, if the new concepts have any validity, then if you didn't have them before, it's a good thing to have them. And if you step onto the old concepts tenaciously, you know, you might not have seen the new concepts because our concepts get in the way of our thinking because we're projecting what we're thinking onto every situation and the world becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So to suspend that and then to find something new, that's a good thing. I mean, you never, just because it's a new concept doesn't mean you finally got the right answer. I mean, it's not the right answer. It's, the right answer is never there. That's the darn thing about truth. You know, you go, isn't that what Socrates said? Right? I think that's what I said, pretty much. You know, all that I know is, is that I know nothing. You know? Uh, so part of knowing is not knowing. And you, but you also, it's also knowing things. But, but, you know, it never ends. But people aren't happy with that. They want the absolute answers. Look at the mess that's throwing the world into. Right? So, but then you have another problem, which is absolutism tends to drive relativism out of the, uh, out of the picture. And the absolutism that you see in the world today is only creating more absolutism in response. And now we're in a real mess. Whereas what we're trying to do is to teach relativism. I, I would suppose that's one label to give. Yeah. Are you going to elaborate on the emptiness, emptiness of violence tomorrow? Did you mention it quickly? Um, yeah. The, when I was here a year ago, um, I don't know how, but in the emails back and forth, um, I decided to give a seminar on parallels between postmodernism and Buddhism because they're very similar. Um, and they're really interesting that independently, scholars from two different world traditions would come upon some of the same questions. Um, but I gave that seminar from the perspective of postmodernism, from the perspective of European philosophy. I took those thoughts back with me home, and my home is in northern Mexico on a very nice beach, okay, very isolated. And, uh, um, I thought a lot about the problem from the perspective of Tibetans because I try, as part of my research, I try to read a little Tibetan every day. So I'm reading, constantly reading in Tibetan, otherwise you'll lose your skills and won't, your skills won't grow. And so I'm reading these incredible texts uh, that, I mean, I love, think about it when you read like a 16th century Tibetan text, the, what you learn lasts forever, right? When you read a new manual to the new update of your of your Firefox, or <laughs> uh, that lasts about two years. You can't even sell the manual, you know. And everything you learn is is wasted time. So I I'm not as I mean I know some programs, but I don't put a lot of energy into learning programs because all that knowledge becomes semi wasted compared to the Tibetan manuscripts. So I'm reading these Tibetan manuscripts, and I'm realizing, oh yeah, they do ask the same questions, but let's follow up how they're asking those questions. How do they deal with the dilemma? How do we think using formal, rigorous thoughts? How does the formalization of our thinking help us to understand? But at the same time, how does that formalization become one of these prejudices that we get locked into that prevent us from seeing anything new? And the two necessarily go together. The limits and the and the and the limit and the benefits come at the same time. The formalization allows us to make discoveries, and it also closes us off to other discoveries. 
And they know that's a problem. And in their tradition, given that they were in a different time and place, they're asking, how do we find truth if the minute we have it, we don't have it? It's a wonderful question. So I, I got carried away. And I started translating texts that have never been translated because they were so interesting. And so I wrote a short talk. I'm, I'm going to give that talk. Um, it's a little technical if you're not into, into Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, but uh, since I wrote it as a result of the talk I gave here, I, I insisted that they let me give the talk here. So uh, that's the, uh, the, the uh, sort of phenomenology, but f from a non-European perspective. That answer more or less? Yeah. Somebody has a question. Does anybody, are you interested in ever doing anything like this? Or does it sound too hard? Yeah. I think it would be an interesting path to take in life, but I think it's also very risky, and I'm not sure how I would go about it, like going out and traveling into different cultures and just sitting there and experiencing it. Like well, how you can do it in your own culture. Huh? You can do it in your own culture. You don't have to travel to different cultures. There's a lot of practices that people do. But wouldn't I be sort of biased by li having lived in my own culture? I mean, well, it is one of the reasons I took the Tibetans to study logic was I had, didn't have as many biases with them as I would have had uh, here. Yeah, it's a problem, but it's not insurmountable. Um, the here's the here's the real hard thing. The going out part, when you go out and find a new research setting, it's the scariest thing. I mean, I'm, I'm approaching coffee firms and coffee tasters who are part of my culture, and I know how to get along with them. And since a lot of people in the coffee business were juvenile delinquents at one point, uh, you know, they're kind of easy to get along with, right? Um, you know. It's not like wine tasters. That's, that that I didn't do because you know, you know I, I have a hard time uh, you know dressing up for for the part. Uh, so um, I'm scared shitless every time I go to a new coffee firm. I arrive in Santos, which is the heart of the coffee industry. Santos, Brazil. That's the port where all the coffee that came down the river and the railroads in Brazil in the, in the early 19th century, where all the coffee ended up and got packaged onto boats that turned coffee into a world commodity. That's where coffee is. And those buildings were built in the early part of the 20th century. And the families are still the same families. And I was scared to death. How do I even call them up? I mean, you can see my hand tremble, and I'm an outgoing guy, right? People who are not outgoing, I mean, they can't even do the work. Uh, but as it turned out, uh, they were great guys. They said, come on in, we'll show you everything. And it turned out, because Santos is on the beach, a lot of them were surfers. And I ran into them surfing, and then they said, oh, great, I, I didn't know you surfed. Yeah, well, uh, why don't you come by again tomorrow? You know, we'll, we'll show you some new coffees, right? Some new blends. Uh, so, you know, it turned out I spent a month of some of the best coffee research I've ever done. And I almost didn't go. I was so paralyzed by fear. Why? Because when you go out and do field work, you are scared that the people are going to reject you. It's kind of scary to put yourself out to people I don't even know them, right? I once gave my students the task of, of interviewing non-Western students on campus for their views of their education at the University of Oregon. Non-Western students. I meant uh, people from Asia, Africa. Um, I had a student walk up. He said, how do you expect me to go there? I'd go up to, to, to complete stranger from the East Coast and Ask them uh, to, to do a conversation, you know, I mean, completely missing, right? Um, on the other hand, when I went to, uh, to the Aborigines, I remember uh, the night 
camping, because it was a two-day car ride to where the Aboriginals were living, I was just so, I couldn't sleep. You know, will these Aboriginals, they don't want to be researched. They don't want white people around. You know, well, how are they going to, to take me? Will they like me? Well, it turned out most people are nice. You know, that's the good thing. I discovered that long ago. Yes? How long do you stay at the places? How long, like, how long do you stay at the places? When do you know you are done? That's an excellent question. Um, you stay until the data that you're getting becomes so repetitive that you can predict it yourself and you start to get bored. Then you have enough. But as long as you're learning something new, you owe it, and you don't have an answer in time that's good for all. Every research situation requires a different length of time because you. <laughs> but I, my question was that um, with the observation, what we would if you come back again, if you stay there for a bit and they, then go away and then come back again because. Um, oh, the nightmare is worse than you're imagining. <laughs> the nightmare is much worse. I went and spent a whole week going to Savona, where I have a, a cousin, so I could stay there. And I made good connections and got permission to videotape in the laboratory of the people. When, when the coffee arrives at the harbors, the main harbors of Italy, Savona is one, Trieste is another, uh, they don't just unload the coffee. You go in with this long mechanical arm into the middle of the bag, and you grab a sample at random, and you bring it back, and you roast that green coffee, and you taste it at the wharf. There are tasters who work at the wharf. And they taste it to make sure that they didn't swap coffees, that they didn't sell you the really great coffee, uh, you know, at, uh, let's say, $4 a pound, uh, and instead give you the dollar and a half a pound coffee that has, has all these, these uh, horrible fermented defects. Uh, so you have to be, and, and if you're paying top dollar, you want the coffee that has this vanilla ending, aftertaste. And so the, the notes say vanilla aftertaste, so the descriptions have to be objective to that extent. And so you're tasting, do you, do you taste the vanilla aftertaste? Well, you know, what is a vanilla aftertaste, right? And it's kind of like a vanilla aftertaste. And if it's the wrong coffee, you don't unload it. 
and the company has to eat it. So they end up selling it uh, to somebody at you know ten percent of the price. So oh, the story though is so I set it all up to do that research, but we didn't have time to to do the right work. He said, "You got to come back when we've got more coffees." Okay, I'll come back. What's the best month? Oh, okay, I'll come back in April. I went back in April the following year. Oh, I'm sorry, you don't have permission anymore. The management has changed. We have new management. You have to get new permission. And so I called up. He said, what? Somebody, sociologist wants to research this? No, we're not going to do that. Because right? all my connections had retired. So the worst case scenario, I had to, to wait and do more research. And by the time I showed up, all my permissions lapsed. So I absolutely got nothing out of it except a couple of visits to my cousins. Research is tough. Research is tough. It's not like, a, it's not easy, but it's certainly rewarding. I mean, you learn things, have good experiences. Okay, thanks a lot. You're a great audience. I appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you, Ken, and, and we hope that your, your, you know, when you uh, publish about these thoughts, you have uh, sort of, uh, you are developing because okay. you visited Olpo, you <laughs> called them all the Olpo lectures. <laughs>